All right, so it's a pleasure to uh, have the second course in this discussion meeting by Francois Gerito from University of Lille. So Francois will be speaking about Coxeter groups and affine accents. Thank you. Thank you very much and many thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to speak. Uh, it's my first visit to the south of India. Um, the, uh, the theme of the, of the series of lectures will be group manifolds and affine manifolds. Uh, by group manifolds, I will be meaning, let's take GLE group. And in fact, in all the um, situations I will be really talking about, this will be um, either SO21 of R, which is just the, the uh, group PSL2R of isometries of the hyperbolic plane. So that's everybody's favorite group in principle. Uh, or maybe SOPQ. Uh, but it will not get any fancier than this. Um, Okay, and um, this is a group, but it's also a space, and it will be our model space when we talk about group manifolds. So this means, uh, as a space, G is acted on by the product G cross G. And the way this goes is, um, G H acts on an element U by multiplying on the two sides. So I want to write this as H U G inverse. It's a slightly uh, complicated way of saying that the uh, that we have a well-defined multiplication uh, law in G and uh, the multiplications from the left and from the right commute. Okay, so G cross G is the group of uh, structure automorphisms of G as a space. So there's G on, on all the levels and that, that might be a, a significant source of confusion. Um, but we have to work with this. Okay, and a, so a group manifold is a quotient of G by some discrete subgroup. Um, of the structure group G cross G. Um, and I will also be talking about affine manifolds and a, a relationship between the two. What is an affine manifold? It's just a quotient um, of Rn by a discrete subgroup of the affine transformations. So that's uh, the group of translations, Rn, on which, uh, I mean, semi-direct product with uh, GLn. Right, I can act linearly on Rn, but I can also act by translations, and together these two um, types of transformation generate the so-called affine group. Affine group. And at, at one point in the series of lectures, I will be giving a short historical survey about what we know uh, concerning affine manifolds. But the short summary is not that much. We don't really know what discrete subgroups can act in this way in general. Uh, and, and mainly this, uh, these talks will be about methods for constructing examples, uh, especially from uh, 
uh, manifold groups. Okay, so to give you a sense of why these two things might be related, let's, um, uh, what I want to do is show how this Cartesian product G cross G is also secretly a semi-direct product related to the semi-direct product you have over here. So let's um, take an element in G cross G And for some reason, I want to write it B A. And the, the group law is just that if I multiply it by B prime A prime, it gives me B B prime A A prime. And okay, there's a certain subgroup of G cross G here and that plays a special role for us. It's the diagonal uh, embedding of G. Namely, if you have, if G equals H, then what you are doing here is just conjugating U by something. And conjugation is an important idea. It fixes the identity. So this is, a, in fact, the stabilizer of the, the uh, neutral element. It's an important subgroup. Uh, one way of, of um, highlighting this subgroup is to um, identify B as uh, I want to write, um, write B as H times A, comma A. And so in this way, when H is zero, we have a, a uh, an element of the of the designated diagonal embedding times h prime a prime a prime is again h a h prime um, a prime a a prime and this can also be seen as Um, H A H prime A inverse times A A prime A A prime. And the reason I, I write this in this way is that I want uh, the the first factor to be something times the second factor, like, like in the H A A, H A prime A prime. And again here, and what I see here is um, this, the, the semi-direct uh, pro uh, product multiplication law. So this is just, if I map this over to H A in the group, G semi-direct G, where the right factor acts on the left by conjugation. So this is this is just a, another way of writing the, the same pair. H prime A prime. So different let me write it with a big dot, different multiplication law. And what I see is H times A, uh, H prime A inverse, A, A prime. Right? And this is just um, A dot H. Okay, so the, the direct product of G cross G is also the semi-direct product of G by G um, up to a change of coordinates, right? You have to, to take the first diagonal, the diagonal G cross G as one axis and the, uh, the correction, the, 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 uh, the, co the, the ratio of the two uh, elements as your uh, second coordinate H. 
Okay. And now this um, this uh, uh, semi-direct product construction has also a, an infinitesimal version. renormalized limit or whatever you like to call it which is um, the Lie algebra of G is acted on by the group G by what's called the adjoint action and the adjoint the adjoint action is just the conjugation um, action for very small elements for elements that are infinitesimally close to the identity um, and the way this works is that if you have a, an element x of the Lie algebra, comma, um, an element g of the group, and you multiply this by x prime g prime, and it's supposed to give you x plus the adjoint action of g on x prime, uh, G, G prime. Right, and G is now a, a copy of Rn for some n. It has more structure than that, but it's in particular a, 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 a vector space. And uh, here we have affine transformations of that vector space uh, in the first coordinate. So, so that, that's that's literally what we're, we will be talking about all the time. The, the, the examples of fine actions that I will be showing you will be all coming from, uh, from uh, limits of group actions in this way. Okay, so let me, let me talk about some examples. One example that I that I that is not so relevant for what I will be talking about next, but which, which is uh, familiar and uh, and nice, I think, is take G to be SO three. Um, so this is well known to be the same as the unit sphere of the quaternions S three modulo. Uh, sign, so just uh, uh, a copy of the projective three space. Right? The, the, the way this identification works is that uh, if if a Q is a unit quaternion, so the, the ring of quaternions is, uh, uh, as you know, R plus I, R plus J, R plus K, R, with some with certain multiplication rules on I, J, K. Um, then denoting this sum, the pure imaginary quaternions as a, a vector space V, a, a copy of three-dimensional Euclidean space, um, we have the following. U mapped to Q, U, Q inverse is a, an isometry of V. Uh, which is to say it belongs to SO, SOV or SO3. And this map, conjugation by a unit quaternion. And if you take negative that quaternion, the conjugation is the same, which explains why you have to mod out here by plus or minus. And in fact, it's an asymmetry of V. Uh, it's the rotation. Um, It's a rotation of angle uh, arc cos of real part of Q uh, 
around axis. Um, imaginary part of Q, which is a, a vector in D. And that's a familiar, way, a familiar way of realizing rotations in three space, and in fact, it's very useful computationally. I, I think there are, in the industry, there are robots that are uh, controlled by, uh, when you, whenever you have a robot, you have to compose the motions of the various joints, and uh, a very computationally efficient way of doing this is to multiply matrices in, in SO3 as quaternions. Um, Okay, so in this context, we have uh, isometries of G, so let's say the neutral isometry, the neutral component of the isometries is uh, G cross G, as on the left black ball. Um, and it's also Take the isometries of S3. S3 is almost the same as G, right? Up to a, a up to a um, sign. Um, that's S3 cross S3 modulo uh, one one and minus one minus one. But that's also by the, the correspondence over here. It's also the same as S3, semi direct SO3. Right, so that, and that's a, no, the point stabilizer. It's SO4, right? So, uh, uh, and another, another way of phrasing this is that if you have an element of S3, it's given by where it takes the, the base point one of S3, where it takes it, and then with what orientation. Right? You have a, a, an, an isotropic group Isotropic group of S S three, just S O three, the 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 stabilizer of a point. All the possible ways of uh, changing your your uh, base frame around the, the base point and then pushing the, the base point over by an element of S three. It's itself a group. Okay, and when we renormalize. Um, by looking at uh, elements of S3 very close to the identity, we get R3 semi-direct SO3. Uh, sorry. Uh, semi-direct group SO3. So that's just a group of rigid motions of space. Um, it's called also the, the Galilean group. Those are the, the affine transformations that uh, also preserve the, the Euclidean distance in, in R3. Uh, here you should see the, the copy of R3 here as a rescaled limit of S3. When you take a larger and larger sphere in the limit, it, it looks less and less curved and eventually flat when the radius gets to infinity. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, the, the second example I, I want to talk about is, in fact, there will be a lot of emphasis on, on, on that example later on, is uh, the same dimension, except you take G to be SO21, as announced uh, earlier. So algebraically, in a sense, it's, it's up to complexification, it's the same, right? SO21 and SO3 are just two real forms of the same complex uh, Lie group. So there will be a lot of common, a lot in common with this uh, quaternion business over here. Okay, so there will be a lot of common, a lot in common, in particular, um, the, the group is still three-dimensional, um, meaning we can, we can draw pictures of it, the group, the, the model space. And let me draw, let me try and draw a concrete picture of, of, um, of SO21. So it's SO21, but most of the time we will be thinking of it, thinking of it as PSL2 of R. Um, so that's the group of matrices A, B, C, D, such that A, D minus B, C equals one up to sign. And what this looks like is, okay, you have, um, Instead of writing it like this, I'll, I'll just say AD minus, the, the determinant should be positive and we mod out by R star. So uh, the reason is it's, uh, more, it might be more pleasant to write it like this is that uh, this is homogeneous in ABCD. A, so we can projectivize and, and work in P3. So we are basically dealing with uh, projective quadruples ABCD subject to a, a, a quadratic condition. So there will be a quadric in, uh, in projective three space. So let me draw a picture in projective three space. Basically the, <coughs> the set of quadruples A, B, C, D, projective. The, um, This surface, it extends out to infinity. Um, it's a hyperboloid. And it's the set of points where the, the determinant vanishes. And out at infinity, it, it intercepts a, a disk in the planet infinity. Um, there's another disk here. There's a center point. Let's play, place the identity at the center. And maybe I can put, I can draw an axis on this horizontal plane and there's a projective line going through infinity here. Now this disk out at infinity is the same as the one below because we work in projective space and Maybe I can, give, I can say what all these matrices are. So red would be the diagonal matrices. Um, the disk here would be the symmetric matrices. By, by diagonal symmetry, I always mean two by two matrices, right? Two by two matrices that are diagonal, two by two matrices that are symmetric. Um, out at infinity is the set of matrices that are traceless. Okay, that's a, the particular choice of chart that I made. Um, those are the rotation matrices uh, along the, the vertical axis. Maybe I can use another color. Mm. 
the rotations. Um, some more matrices. There's a cone here of parabolic matrices. Parabolic means um, a repeated eigenvalue. And um, that's this. So the, the surface, as I mentioned before, was determinant uh, equals zero. The outside is the, the region where the determinant is negative. And of course, we could, uh, that's just another copy of the same space, right, up to a projective transformation. So we could incorporate, if we worked in PGL2 instead of PSL2, deal both with the inside and outside. Um, what else can we mention? Well, okay, uh, and then there's, there's how, the, how this uh, boundary uh, region is uh, subdivided, it's foliated, right? This quadric, this uh, one-sheeted hyperboloid is foliated in two different ways. And I'm going to talk about this maybe in another picture. Yes? Yes, yeah, exactly in this way. We, we projectivize these quadruples A, B, C, D. So they live in a, in a couple of P3. Um, and I'm going to write down actually what those matrices are now. So there was identity, one, one, zero, zero. And there was, a, there was this line of diagonal matrices in fact, um, the one here is one in the upper left corner, the one there is one in the lower right corner. So that's all consistent, right? They are both symmetric and the, and the identity is a linear combination of them. Uh, and then something funny happens when you look at, the, at, at this uh, boundary hyperboloid, namely Okay, where are the other uh, base elements? This would be one in the lower left, and that's one in the lower right, in the upper right. One, zero, zero, one, zero. And they both appear at the top again. Um, at the top, this is one in the lower left, and that is one in the upper right. And what you have next is that when you connect, when you take the, the, the line embedded here, uh, I have to extend it so it goes all the way through uh, that point. That's a line contained in the brick. And there's a, another line, uh, I should take a stock different color, right here. And, well, okay, so this is this is very far uh, down below. So in fact, it eventually goes through that point. It's the same point, right? So if we um, draw the same two lines through the other point on the equator. to find a line that goes this way and the last line goes to 
those two. So eventually, on that red line, what do we see? We see all linear combinations of one in the upper left and one in the lower left. So this red line is the line of matrices of this form, star star in the first column and zero zero in the second column. Similarly, if we do the other red line, we are going to find um, zero in the first column and whatever in the right column. And if we look at the, <clears throat> the blue lines, we find that this blue line consists of all matrices whose second line is zero. And the first line is anything. And the other blue line corresponds to matrices with zeros in the first line. Right, and more generally, whenever you have um, you have this foliation, this double foliation of the, of the quadric into lines. Uh, and And any uh, red line corresponds to, like in the, in the previous picture, corresponds to matrices which have a given vector in their kernel. So a, a constant subspace. Uh, a, constant subspace in their kernel, and a blue line corresponds to the family of matrices that have the same image. So rank one matrices. Constant line. Constant line. Right, so then those were only particular examples of such lines. Um, Okay, what more can I want to say about this? Right, the, um, the, um, the action of G by left and right multiplication on this, on this uh, region of space can be a challenge to visualize. However, it's the same dimension as the, the action of the isometry group of H3 on itself, right? A, a projective action preserving a certain quadric. So in a sense, it should not be harder to, to, to visualize than, the, than the, the motions of H3. And maybe I can, I can um, make explicit how if uh, G, H, um, in G are both loxodromic, And I'm going to take up to conjugation, uh, take them both diagonal. Then um, the action U goes to G U H inverse. Um, so that's an. an Automorphism of uh, P3, this map. In fact, of, of uh, P3, comma, um, let's call this P2 plus 1. Right? Uh, that's projective space together with this quadric. It's a certain automorphism, a, a projective automorphism of it, and it has um, eigenvectors, which means fixed points, right? As, um, so if U 
is um, x, y, z, t. That goes to uh, if g is just a, a inverse, and h is just b, b inverse, diagonal matrices, then here I'm going to see a, x, b inverse, a, y, b, a inverse, z, uh, b inverse, a inverse, t, b. Hence, so this is the same map here. Hence, um, the matrices with, with three zero entries are the eigen directions of this uh, of this action. Eigen uh, vectors or projective vectors. So you can see them on the on the picture over here. The, the four, well, the the four white directions drawn on the on the boundary. Uh, so that's one part of the action that you can uh, that that you can uh, visualize more or less easily. The uh, since those vectors are fixed, the the lines between them are fixed, or the planes spanned by any three of them are fixed. So that's a lot of a lot of information that you have. Eigenvector of um, of that particular uh, map, right? That particular endomorphism written by a dot. That particular endomorphism of P3, right? But again, there, there are many more uh, automorphisms of, of P3. But generically, if you have a di if you have two diagonal elements, two diagonalizable elements acting on the left and right, you will have this situation with four. Um, uh, eigen directions in uh, in projective uh, in projective space. Yes, that's why the next thing I wanted to mention. If you take a map like this where uh, G and H are equal, right, then you are just dealing with the, the action of PSL two R on itself by conjugation that fixes the identity, uh, and it also fixes the the. The, well, the dual, the orthogonal, or this planetity of traceless maps, uh, meaning it's, it acts linearly on this particular chart. So then we are just dealing with the usual linear action of PSL2R on three space. So uh, that's the standard SO21 action. It preserves, well, it preserves the identity, it preserves the, the cone of parabolic elements. It preserves this hyperboloid, and it preserves the disk at infinity, which is a copy of H2. So it's just a, a copy of the isometry group of H2. So um, the note. The diagonal embedding on G acts linearly on this chart. Preserving a copy of H2 at infinity. Um, Another thing we could mention is that G cross G G cross G, I'm using the same two colors as uh, for the foliations, uh, acts on the two foliations, on the two foliations. 
namely you have a, a circle of blue lines and a circle of red lines. Um, so, um, acts on the circle of blue lines. circle of uh, blue, uh, red lines. Uh, so this gives you a way of seeing the product structure uh, in, the, in the action on P3, right? It's a, um, if you act only from the left, then every red line will stay put and the blue lines are permuted by a, a, a uh, Möbius transformation of the, of the project, real projective line. And if you act only from the right, then the red lines stay put and the blue lines move around. Okay, so that, that's uh, some geometric intuition that I can help uh, create here. Why does such an element act non-trivially? Um, Right, so this is a description of uh, determinant equals zero for non-zero matrices. So in other words, rank equals one. And whenever you're in the boundary, you, the rank is exactly one. It's less than two, it's more than zero, so it's one. Uh, so you have a line of kernel and a line of image and, and nothing else. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to speak about is the... Um, a source of uh, actual, no, notice I have only talked about the global geometry, G and its uh, transformation group so far. Now I, now I want to say something about actual discrete subgroups and situations where the, the quotient is proper. So this will take the form of a theorem. And mostly what I will be doing in the, in the remainder of this lecture is state this theorem and some, and some variants of it. Um, but the, the, the main, the general structure will be always the same. So basically the statement goes uh, like this. So uh, quotients. G and G theorem. Suppose um, G lives in the isometry group of X. And here I want nothing particularly fancy. If G is our example over there of the isometry group, group of H2, then think uh, think x equals h2 um, and if I have two representations of a, an abstract group, an abstract discrete group gamma into g, so rho and j go into g cross g and I'm deliberately choosing different uh, letters here because I want a, a, a different assumption on J, J uh, of gamma acting on X properly discontinuously. What properly discontinuous means is that if you take a compact set, then it's moved away from itself by all but finitely many elements, right? And that's, that's, that's what a, a good action is for us because it means there's a, a nice quotient. There's a, a, the quotient is topologically Hausdorff, uh, meaning it's, uh, let's say, well, proper or Hausdorff quotients. Um, so suppose this, and suppose furthermore that there exists 
So this is all part of the assumptions. Uh, suppose there's a, there exists a map f from x to x that's equivariant for the two uh, for the two um, representations of gamma. So you have j of gamma acting on the source, rho of gamma acting on the target. It's equivariant. And um, C Lipschitz with C less than one. So Lipschitz is, is, uh, is um, in the sense of the metric on X, right? X was a metric space. Then, uh, we have an, an actual group manifold, so that's G over J rho of gamma by the left-hand reaction is Hausdorff. Meaning that the pair J rho acts on G properly discontinuously. Uh, and moreover, we can say um, something about this space, namely, well, we can add the, the condition here that um, G acts transitively on X. Is obviously the case in the in the reference example, meaning if it moves any point, it can move any point to any other point. So under this extra assumption, we have uh, that M fibers. Over um, the quotient in the assumptions, so J gamma dividing out X with fiber stabilizer of a base point. Yes. So I'm going to, to, um, to prove this particular variant in some uh, detail because it's, it's in fact almost just symbol pushing and then I'll go faster over the over how the proofs of the other variants go and I want to give you a sense of why this equi this contraction property is important so proof Proof goes as follows: We construct a a uh, map pi. So define pi a map from G to X. And that's the following: You have an element G. You take it to the fixed point of G inverse F. So what's this? You, ha you had this uh, this map F. Uh, over in the assumptions, that's contracting. You compose it to an isometry that's still contracting, and therefore a contracting map has a fixed point somewhere. You just iterate it, uh, and uh, the points get, get closer and closer to each other. Uh, F contracting. And G is isometric. Now I claim that um, pi is uh, equivariant for the following action. It's the action J rho on the source G um, and the action J 
on the target X. Right, so this is the action on G, that's the action on X. So this is the symbol pushing part. Let me, let me just show why it holds. So suppose pi of G equals X. Uh, sorry. Which is to say, um, G of X equals F of X. I'm going to, to, to draw this as a circle of equivalences. So, does this imply, that's the question, that pi of j gamma, oh, sorry, rho gamma, uh, g, j gamma inverse equals j gamma of x, right? That, that's the equivariance property that I'm claiming. If you act by j of gamma on the, on the right hand side, x, then you act by j rho on the left hand side and the equality is preserved. Okay, so this means by definition that uh, g of x is f of x. Now by equivariance of f, This means that um, sorry, so this f of j gamma of x equals rho of gamma times g of x. This can also be written rho of gamma g j of gamma inverse times j of uh, gamma x j of gamma x. I'm just inserting a j of gamma j of gamma inverse uh, before the before the argument x equals f of j of x, j of gamma x. Um, and here we recognize j of gamma x All right, so in other words, uh, rho of gamma g, j of gamma inverse takes j of gamma x to the same point as f, which means Pi of, well, it, it's a, uh, that closes the loop, right? Then we have an equivalence. Um, okay, so that is a, a source of, uh, of actions on, the, on a group. And for instance, if you, if you take an action purely from the left, you take gamma to be a, a discrete subgroup of G, uh, so J is just the, the embedding of this discrete subgroup and rho is, let's say, the trivial representation. Then what we are dealing with is a quotient of G by a discrete subgroup on the left. And that's always, uh, always a, a Hausdorff quotient. But the theorem here gives us a, a whole range of different uh, of deformations of this. Namely, we can, we can change a little bit this trivial deformation rho on the, on, on, the, on the other side as long as it does not move points in some sense more than J does. Okay, so here comes the first variant. Infinitesimal variant.
theorem. Uh, G and X are as before. And suppose we have a representation, uh, so I want to call, it, call this U, J, from an abstract group, discrete group, into the semi-direct product of the Lie algebra, sorry, this way, a joint J, which I can also think of as the tangent space of J, right? It's the space of germs uh, of, um, of paths in G up to uh, first, uh, well, first order germs in G, right? Um, so if this representation of gamma has the, uh, has the following property, as before, uh, J of gamma acts discrete, uh, well, properly discontinuously on the, on the metric space X, and there exists This time it won't be a, an equivariant map, like here, it will be the infinitesimal version of a map. Instead of F, there will be an, an equivariant vector field. So B, vector field on X, such that um, it's C contracting, or some negative number C, meaning the following. If I take the distance between um, a point P perturbed by the vector field at P, so exponential at P of T V of P, where V is my vector field, and same thing, I perturb a point Q by T V of Q. I take this distance and differentiate with, with respect to T. And that's less, well, that's at most C times uh, the distance between uh, P and Q for all P Q in X. <clears throat> the, the picture to have in mind here, this, dif uh, this um, differential here can be written d prime sub v of p and q, right? The derivative, uh, the differentiated distance, the derived distance between p and q according to the vector field v. It's uh, negative and uh, it gets more and more negative as p and q grow further apart. So the picture to have in mind here is that your vector field, when your two, two points are far apart, your vector field tends to bring them closer together. And that's all this uh, property is saying. Right? And you can, you can uh, see that it's a natural analog of the, the Lipschitz contraction property for the map over in the first theorem. So if, if the, there is a vector field that's contracting in this sense an equivariant, so J, U, uh, U, J, equivariant, meaning that if I take the vector field at J of gamma P, I'm going to find J of gamma pushing forward the vector field at P, plus a correction depending on U. So just U of gamma at J of gamma P. Uh, 
again, if there is, if I have a, a, a pair UJ such that there is an, a contracting equivariant vector field, then like before, there will be a, a nice quotient Then, um, UJ of uh, gamma acts properly discontinuously on the on the D algebra G. So this is a Hausdorff quotient. meaning the, U, the, the affine action uj is properly discontinuous. Um, and under the, um, under the assumption that, let's see, what I want to say here, Right, under the assumption that um, the, uh, there's, an, uh, there's a natural analog of this, this assumption that uh, G act transitively on the, on the vector field X, which is to <coughs> the assumption that you have um, if G if the, the collection of um, well, if, if G <laughs> Finds the full tangent space of X at a base point, um, then this uh, this house of quotient fibers over. the initial quotient of x. So again, then that's the, that's the red little extra that we get. Okay, so without, uh, in, in, the, in the remaining time, I'd like to talk about a standard, and in fact, for, for, for our purposes, the only way of generating such examples. So examples, And let's call this theorem two and that theorem one. An example of a theorem one would be take uh, the free group, I mean, the, the group freely generated by three copies of z over 2z. Would be your gamma. And this has many uh, nice actions on the, on the hyperbolic plane, H2. Namely, you, you take just three reflections and take them with disjoint, um, disjoint uh, axes bounding a, bounding a domain like here. Um, so, if the generators are sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, they are the reflections in those in those lines. So, J of gamma generated by reflections in ultra 
ultra parallel lines. So that's our J, and then we want a, a, um, a second action, rho, to be uh, in some sense less, less, uh, to move points less than J does. And the way to do this is find if L1, L2, L3 are the, are the, the initial lines, find L prime 1, L prime 2, L prime 3 closer to one another than the Li. Uh, and what I mean by closer is, let's say, um, one way of doing this is uh, in, in the projective model, here is the triple of uh, the initial triple of lines and defines a triangle. And if I take a slightly larger ellipsoid, yes, in this ambient projective plane, then in this new ellipsoid, which in, uh, in this new ellipse, which is a new copy of uh, H3, the lines look closer together, right? Because the, whenever I have a point, a pair of points, one on this line, one on that line, there's a formula defining the distance between them in terms of the cross ratio um, uh, measured along the, the line. So a, let H be the first copy of H2, H prime be the second copy of H2, and we have the distance in H of P and Q is here, Q is there. Uh, that distance is just half the log of the cross ratio, uh, UPQV. And that will be, by definition, I mean, by, by yeah, definition of the cross ratio, this will be larger than the distance in H prime. P and Q, which is the half log of V prime, P, Q, V prime. Prime is out here, and V prime is out there. So in the bigger uh, hyperbolic plane, the, point, the points look closer. And we can conjugate the two actions back uh, to, uh, into the same copy of SO2, SO2 one to make everything live in, in G. And so we have this contraction property between the two actions. Conjugate isometry isometries of H2 and isometries, I mean, isometries of H and isometries of H prime back into one and the same copy of SO21. We find J. Gamma and O of gamma. Does that make sense? Now, the related example for uh, two. Oh, and yeah, what is our equivariant map? 
the map F that's supposed to be equivariant for uh, F and J. Well, in this picture, it's just the identity, right? It will, once you conjugate uh, into, the, into uh, the same copy of SO21, it will not look the, like the identity, it will look like some projective map on this hyper-ideal triangle. But in this uh, particular view, everything is arranged so that, that, that you're actually looking at the identity. The, the same two points look closer in the big ellipsoid than they are in the small one. And that's exactly the contraction property that you want. So essentially, F is the identity composed right and left by, by whatever is required. Um, okay, and uh, the, this example can be differentiated. This can be differentiated. by taking a one parameter family of uh, copies of H2. I'm increasing uh, one parameter family of ellipses. So essentially, if uh, Ft goes from H2 to H2 and is equivariant with respect to um, J0 and Jt of gamma, one plus Ct Lipschitz for negative C. So if this uh, uh, satisfies one, the assumptions of theorem one, then V of, of P defined as the derivative Ft of p, so it's just a, a tangent vector at p, it satisfies automatically p. And so the, the contraction assumption differentiates to the contraction assumption of, the, of theorem 2, and the equivariance assumption in theorem 1 differentiates to the uh, equivariant assumption in theorem 2. So these are not just analogs, these are actual as an actual, you can, you can actually fit them into the same uh, global statement that I'm not going to write down, but we, we could. Um, I think I have exactly 36 seconds left, so we'll stop here for today. But tomorrow we'll discuss some coarse versions of this, where instead of a, instead of a map, you'll have a coarse map, and instead of a fixed point, you'll have just something coarsely defined. Uh, that will allow us to, to um, make this idea here work in a much more general uh, situation than just uh, reflections in disjoint planes.